In all of human history, there could be a few gifts which were simultaneously so spectacular and so utterly reviled. So, place slap bang in the middle of Warsaw, the Palace of Culture and Science is an architectural monster. From the early 1950s until 2022, it was the tallest building in Poland, and to this day, it remains the sixth tallest in the EU. Its footprint, too, is gigantic. Covering 35,000 square meters, it dominates the surrounding area like nothing else. Yet it's not just size that makes the palace of culture and science fascinating, but also where it came from. An origin story that explains why, even to this day, some Varsovians hate it with an intensity usually reserved for Russian autocrats. This building, you see, was a gift to Poland from none other than Joseph Stalin. And not just any old gift. With Poland's newly under communist domination, the palace was intended to show everyone who is boss. A reminder forged from 40 million bricks that the Soviets were here to stay. A brick reminder that we're going to analyze today. Ask most people in the world to point you in the direction of Peking, and they'll probably get confused and assume you're using the old-fashioned name for the Chinese capital of Beijing. But not in Warsaw. Here in Poland's seat of government, everyone always knows where Peking is. It's dominating the skyline gazing down impassively on the city that it's towered over for nearly 70 years. That's because Peking is just one of the many nicknames for the Palacz Kulturny i Naukny, a play on the acronym PKIN. Others over the years have included the Nightmare of a Drunken Confectioner and an Upright Towering Outhouse. But we prefer to use the original name, the one it first opened under in 1955, the one that shows just how times have changed in Poland. The full name of the Palace of Culture and Science in the name of Joseph Stalin. Exactly how Warsaw, a city over 1,150 kilometers from Moscow, came to house a building named after one of the 20th century's worst dictators is a fascinating story and one that we're going to cover in the next chapter. For now, though, we simply want to introduce you to today's subject, to the great white elephant, the USSR gifted Poland. Now, the first thing to note is that just like an actual elephant, everything about the palace is gigantic. With over 3,000 rooms spread across 42 floors, the palace sweeps up into the sky from base to roof, measuring 188 meters, that's over 600 square feet. Add in the spire, and the whole structure tops out at a giddying 237 meters. Now, if you're from New York, then that might not sound so big. The Empire State Building is over 200 meters taller, including its antenna, and it's been decades since that was even the tallest building in New York City. By European Union standards, though, well, the palace is a monster. Only five buildings in the EU are taller, and three of them were built this century. In terms of Poland, the palace only relinquished its crown in 2022 with the opening of the nearby Varso Tower. So, yeah, it's a big deal in European terms, a big deal that's also reflected in its total volume of 815,000 cubic meters. But even for those who grew up in skyscraper-heavy countries like America, the Palace of Culture and Science can still hold intense fascination, not only for its measurements, but for its strange Soviet retro style. Officially designed in the style of socialist realism, the palace's chunky white look is today better known as Stalinist architecture or Soviet wedding cake style. Yep, Soviet. Although Poland was never officially part of the USSR, it was absolutely under Moscow's domination. And that domination included its architecture. When it came time to gift the palace from the USSR to the Polish people, the chief architect chosen wasn't a Pole, but a Lev Rudnev, a Russian who'd cut his teeth building one of Moscow's famed Seven Sisters. As you'll note if you look at photos of Rudnev's Moscow State University main building, it looks almost exactly like Warsaw's palace, with one important difference. At 239 meters or 784 feet, the Moscow State University building is a hair taller than its cousin in Poland. Take from that what you will about Stalin's penis-based insecurities. At the time, though, the party press in newly communist Poland didn't note these differences or ask why they were getting a giant wedding cake dumped in their capital. Instead, they gushed over the generosity on display. 
as the People's Tribune declared in 1952. A gift given from the people of one nation to the people of another nation. This is simply unprecedented. So, at this point, it's worth asking where this notion of the palace as a gift came from and why Stalin took so much interest in building a giant skyscraper in the middle of Warsaw. To answer that, we have to travel back in time, back across the decades, back to the dawn after Poland's darkest night, back to the aftermath of the Second World War. While World War II was a catastrophe for many nations, in Poland the destruction reached another level. All across this great and ancient land, cities that had stood for centuries vanished in puffs of red brick dust. Architectural marvels dating to medieval times were burned, looted, torn down, or blown up, leaving only bitter memories in their wake. The city that suffered most of all was Warsaw. Now, we already did a whole video on the World War II destruction and the rebuilding of Warsaw, so we're not going to repeat all of the details in this one. The crib notes version is that the Nazis occupied the city early in the year. In mid-1944, the Poles rose up to defeat them, aware that the Red Army was well on its way and had offered help. But instead of saving the day, the Soviets simply parked up their tanks and patiently waited as the Nazis destroyed the city in revenge. It was only when some 80 to 90 percent of the capital was in ruins that they finally rolled in to liberate the Poles. Uh, liberate very much sarcastic there. By that time, Old Warsaw was gone, obliterated in a sea of vindictive fire. And that blank slate would prove to be ideal for the new communist regime. As the war ended and Varsovians began to emerge from their hiding places to pick through the rubble, the new authorities embarked on two grand projects. The first, to rebuild a portion of the old town that the Nazis had destroyed. The second, to help the Soviets build a whopping great skyscraper. To this day, the second project remains controversial. At a time when much of Warsaw's housing stock had been reduced to scorched brick, many feel the effort could have been better spent on new apartment blocks. Then there's the metro rumor. According to local law, President Boleslav Barut was offered the choice of a skyscraper or a Moscow-style metro system for Poland's gifts. And he chose the skyscraper. This is an especially sore point since Warsaw didn't subsequently get a metro until 1995. Whatever the truth, the important point is that the palace is what the city wound up getting. Lev Radnev was invited from Moscow and a construction star date was inked in for 1952. And so it was that the Varsovians, still living in ruined homes surrounded by bomb craters, would be able to watch as the palace rose above the city like a gleaming white dream. Perhaps a symbol of hope to some, a symbol of oppression for others. For Rudnev, though, it was his chance to give Moscow's seven sisters a brand new sibling. As the architect behind the Moscow State University main building, Rudnev was fairly open about wanting to build a near copy, a great Stalinist folly on a steel frame. But it wouldn't be enough to just create an identical twin to his Russian masterpiece. In the hopes of infusing his new creation with national motifs, Radnev would work in conjunction with a team of Polish architects. In some ways, this arrangement would foster a spirit of true collaboration. Radnev was taken around a few old towns to survive the Nazi bombs, immortal cities such as Krakow and Zamoc, where he took ideas from Polish styles, incorporating stuff like Renaissance-style pointed parapets. It also led to the inclusion of a host of statues both celebrating real Polish historical figures like Copernicus as well as idealized images of Polish workers striving to build a communist paradise. In many other ways, though, the collaboration was more nominal than real. There's a story that the chief Polish architect, Joseph Sigalin, was only given an old photo of the Moscow State University building and told they'd be building something like that. When he traveled to Moscow to try and volunteer some ideas, he was told everything had already been decided. Rudnev had a vision, one that involved a grand public building wowing the masses with its marble walls, vast chandeliers, and endless rooms, a building the communist world could be proud of. The only problem was, neither Rudnev nor anyone else had any idea what it would actually be for.
Hard as it is to believe now, construction began on the palace before its exact uses have been agreed on. Sure, it was to be a public space, and sure, some of the areas, like the Congress Hall, theaters, sports halls, and swimming pool, clearly had a predefined function. But a surprising amount of space was just put aside, safe in the knowledge that the party would eventually figure out what to do with it. And it's not like they could back out on the project now. To make room for the combined palace and parade ground, 3.3 hectares of damaged housing stock on the edge of the old Jewish ghetto had already been demolished and swept aside. And then there were the Soviet workers. While 4,000 Poles would work on the construction site at various times, the core building team comprised of 3,500 workers brought in from the USSR. During construction, these men lived almost completely separate from Warsaw society, staying in a specially built prefab estate on the city outskirts. There, workers had their own canteens, cinema, library, theater, doctor's office, hospital, and even a school and nursery for young family members. It was almost a city within a city. Not that luxury accommodation could make up for the breakneck pace of work, though. Like most things Soviet, the Palace of Culture and Science was built to a strict deadline, one that involved hitting a whole bunch of targets across each year that coincided with important communist festivals. Nor were the workers just there to work. Film crews and journalists were a constant presence on site, and builders were expected to put aside time not just for interviews, but also to go out into Warsaw for meetings between those constructing this behemoth and the grateful Polish comrades who were hosting them. All of this overwork might help explain the 16 fatalities recorded during construction. And while that's a relatively small number, it's still 11 more than died building the much taller Empire State Building two decades earlier. Still, the main goal of getting the project finished at high speed would be a hit. It took just three years for the gleaming white palace to rise out of the ruined slums of post-war Warsaw, a spectacular achievement when you consider the material involved. Creating the skyscraper's frame required 26,000 tons of steel. Around this frame came 40 million bricks. Ungodly numbers of tiles, too, were used on the outer walls, each one manufactured over 2,000 kilometers away, that's 1,500 miles in a remote part of the Ural Mountains and shipped to Poland. Originally, these tiles were the purest white. As the decades passed, though, Warsaw's air pollution would subtly stain them, giving the palace its off-white, creamy color that it has today. Marble, too, had to be shipped in from far afield. A contemporary New York Times article claims that it was brought in from Crimea in the Caucasus Mountains, although uh, we've read more recent sources that say that the marble is actually fake. Or whatever the marble's origins, though, it's hard to argue that the end result is anything but impressive. The Palace of Culture and Science was officially finished in the summer of 1955. On July the 21st, there was a handover ceremony gifting the monster building from the USSR to Poland in perpetuity. What Poland got that day was a building unlike any other. Love it or loathe it, the palace was mass luxury on a scale few people had ever witnessed before. Inside, great chandeliers looked over vast chambers that could fit thousands of people, chambers between which ran great tiled corridors lined with pillars. Corridors leading sometimes to opulent rooms, sometimes to sports arenas, sometimes to cinemas. Outside, it was all vertiginous heights and towering walls dropping away from an observation deck where the whole of Warsaw could be seen by anyone who dropped by and paid a small fee. In fact, a snarky joke soon started doing the rounds that the observation deck had the best view in town purely because it was the one place from where the palace itself couldn't be seen. And interestingly, that's the exact same joke that the Parisians once told about the Eiffel Tower. But while the Eiffel Tower represented French engineering at its finest, the Palace of Culture and Science represented something far more complex. On the one hand, it was a true icon, something that could be instantly recognized by any Pole living outside Warsaw as a symbol of the capital. On the other, it was also a permanent reminder of the post-war tragedy that had befallen Poland, of the way Stalin had taken this once proud republic into a sphere of influence, turning it into a mere vassal state. Not that the tyrants would live to see this reminder completed. Stalin died in March of 1953, over two years before the palace was finished. Yet the end of construction wouldn't mean the end of the story. Not at all. The tale of Warsaw's controversial megapalace continues to this very day. It was only a little over a year after the palace opened that it experienced its first significant change. By February of 1956, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev gave his secret speech, denouncing Stalin's excesses for the first time. 
By November of that year, the ripple effects had spread so far that Warsaw's leaders felt empowered to change the palace's name, removing all references to the murderous dictator. The thaw which followed the secret speech also saw Poles openly questioning the purpose of the palace for the first time, asking why the money hadn't been plowed into houses for those left homeless by the war, questioning the wisdom of a giant monument to Poland's oppression. Still, unlike Stalin's name, the palace itself was simply too big to just be quietly erased. Like it or not, Varsovians would have to live with it. And so began the long journey that would become Poland's experience of life under communism. Interestingly, this experience wasn't as purely grey and joyless as you might assume. Prior to the declaration of martial law in 1981, Poland had a relatively open regime. The key word there being relatively, one that allowed a little more colour in everyday life. Examples of this can be seen by browsing the history of the Palace of Culture, like how on April 14, 1967, the Congress Hall was turned into a concert venue with the Rolling Stones playing to thousands of besuited young party members. This was over a decade before Western acts began to trickle into the Soviet Union. Nor were the Stones the only ones to party in Warsaw's eyesore. Every year, the authorities threw vast New Year's bashes in the palace's grand halls, bashes that saw workers invited from across socialist Poland to get drunk and party in the capital. On the slightly more staid and respectable end of the scale, the palace would also be the site of a mass religious service in 1987 when Pope John Paul II led thousands of local Catholics in prayers from the main entrance. In this way, with these sorts of events, the palace began to worm its way into people's lives, to become part of the mental landscape of Warsaw, appearing in paintings, novels, songs, appearing also in people's weird-ass fantasies. You could judge how smoothly the palace became a fact of Warsaw life just by reading some of the myriad letters sent there over the decades. As the, at the sweeter end of the scale, you have the dozens of kids who wrote Christmas letters there, in the belief that St. Nick lived on the top floor. At the utterly batshit crazy end, you have an angry woman who wrote in to declare that the television antenna was forcing her to experience involuntary orgasms. Yes, really. Yet for all of its seeming solidity, the palace very nearly didn't survive the greatest upheaval of all, the collapse of communism in Poland. The transition from socialist dictatorship to democracy saw a major reassessment of the Stalinist wedding cake in the center of Warsaw. While some wanted to preserve and celebrate it, even adding it to the Registry of Objects of Cultural Heritage in 2007, others simply wanted to destroy it. Things all came to a head in 2009 when then Foreign Minister Radoslav Sikorsky pushed hard for tearing the whole thing down in what he said would be a moment of catharsis. According to Sikorsky, the building was wasteful regarding energy, eye-wateringly expensive to keep functional, and a reminder not of Rolling Stones concerts and weird orgasm women, but decades of oppression. In his opinion, it would have been much better to instead, to quote, have a park with a pond where the inhabitants of Warsaw could go for a picnic. At the time, there was a very real threat that Sikorsky's plan would be acted on, that the palace uh, would soon be pulled down and replaced with something befitting a truly independent Poland. But the moment passed. No demolition, no agreement was ever reached. And so the palace simply continued to stand there, as it had for decades, watching over Warsaw with an air of either benign interest or menace, depending on your point of view. Today, the Palace of Culture remains both one of Warsaw's most distinctive buildings and one of its most controversial. While some Varsovians have grown to look upon it with fondness, others see it as a symbol of Russian oppression, a symbol that has now been turbocharged by Moscow's genocidal war against Ukraine. Look, since I'm not Polish, the debate over the Palace of Culture and Science isn't really one I can take a side on. Suffice to say, the arguments over it will likely continue for as long as it stands. Yet even if you're of the school that would rather see the whole thing stuffed full of dynamite and exploded, it's hard to argue that it isn't, in its own strange way, a spectacular achievement. Here is a true behemoth of a building, a gargantuan monster that assaults the senses and overawes the eyes, an architectural marvel that still ranks among Europe's most imposing buildings seven decades after construction began. It might be odd-looking. It might serve as a reminder of darker times, but one thing is for sure, if any structure is truly deserving of the title of Mega Project, it's Warsaw's bizarre skyscraper palace.